Hello, my name is Sean Thomas Radcliffe. Welcome to this episode of Preservation Oaks. In this series, we introduce you to yet another extraordinary organization serving their community by conserving and preserving our heritage. It could be an organization in your community, in your county, or in your state. Now sit back and relax and enjoy the program. Welcome to this episode of Preservation Oaks. I'm your host, Sean Thomas Radcliffe, coming to you from Salt Lake City. And today we're very lucky to have with us Carrie Eildertz, the Executive Director of the Cedar Falls, Iowa Historical Society. Here's a short biography of our guest. Carrie is a graduate of the University of Northern Iowa, where she earned a BA in History in 2013 and an MA in History with a Public History Emphasis in 2015. She served as assistant director of the Sawmill Museum in Clinton, Iowa for two and a half years before transitioning as executive director of the Cedar Falls Historical Society in July of 2018. The Cedar Falls Historical Society operates the Victorian House Museum, the Ice House Museum, the Little Red Schoolhouse, and the Barron's Rap Station Visitor Center in Cedar Falls, Iowa. Welcome to the program, Carrie. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. We have a lot to talk about. I went on Google to virtually look at Cedar Falls, and man, there are beautiful homes all throughout Cedar Falls. I mean, really beautiful. There are building trims like I've never seen before. I mean, these are, these are just beautiful. Is it true that because of the beautiful home, Cedar Falls has the nickname the Garden of Iowa? And how did it get that? Yes, yeah, so historically, Cedar Falls was known as the Garden City due to its lovely tree-lined streets and well-kept homes. And I, I don't know if anyone really refers to it that way anymore, but it's certainly true that it is still a very beautiful city. We're fortunate to have beautiful homes, beautiful parks, um, a location right along the Cedar River, and a really nice historic downtown district, which is where the Historical Society is located. In fact, a few years ago, the downtown district was put on the National Register of Historic Places oh, as a national historic district. So um, the historic character is, is really nice and is something that we're really proud to be a part of. It is a shame there's a possibility the river will flood portions of the town every year. Does the historic portion of the downtown ever get flooded? Uh, Fortunately, most of the downtown stays pretty safe, but there are homes along the river, of course, that are always in danger of flooding, and our own Ice House Museum is right down there along the river as well. So we do have a, a flood wall installed now, but unfortunately that is um, not between the Ice House and the river on the other side, so the Ice House is always in danger of flooding. So, it's, yeah, it's, it's nice to have that beautiful river there, but there is always that threat of flood. What do you do when the Ice House floods? I mean... Do you have to sort of foresee it coming and move artifacts and that kind of thing? Yeah, so um, in 2008 was actually one of the worst floods we've ever had, and it was actually flooding throughout Iowa, the Cedar River, and other bodies of water. There was flooding all over that year. And so that year, it happened really quickly, and uh, it got into the ice house, and there was a lot of damage done. And so the ice house was kind of totally reconfigured after that. And as part of that, they raised the floor up past the flood levels of 2008. So hopefully our artifacts will always remain safe, but we are always watching those um, river levels. There's always it seems a few days every spring and fall where 
So we're always checking those river levels and making sure it's not predicted to get up to where it would be a danger for the ice house. And if it is getting close to that, we do have to sandbag. So That's got to keep you um, awake 2000, at night. 2016 was another bad flood where, uh, thankfully, the, the sandbagging helped. But it's something that we're always considering. Yeah, I was saying that's got to keep you awake at night. Yes, it definitely <laughs> does. Residents and members of the Cedar Falls Historical Society, please donate to the society so they have funds available to deal with flooding if it occurs. I know that can't be cheap to get organized people to put sandbags in place and, you know, maybe a pump and, you know, all of those things that have to happen. Anyone wanting to support the society can specify donations be sent to the society from Amazon. So as you're buying on Amazon, you can go to Amazon Smile and you can designate that the society is um, the place you would like to donate. And as you purchase, Amazon will actually donate to the society a portion of your purchases. Have you always been interested in history and what led you to history as a profession? Uh, I think I have always been interested in history. Growing up, I was a big fan of Little House on the Prairie books, and I was always wanting to visit historic sites and things on, on family vacations. And I had never really considered it as a career until I got into high school. I had a really good history teacher there who um, really used a lot of good primary sources and really made history come alive in a way that had it really happened before that in school. So that's when I really started to consider, you know, is there a way that I can take this interest that I have in and turn it into a career? And that's really what led me to museums. Um, I love that museums are a way for history to be shared with the public and for history to really come alive for people and, and really be connected to their own lives in a way that maybe they didn't have in school. I was just talking with uh, someone else in Iowa at a historical center. They were saying, you know, it's not about the artifacts, it's about the stories and the, and the human portion of history that makes it interesting. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would definitely agree. Every, every object has, has a story, and if, if you can convey that story to people and, and show them how that connects to their own lives, that really makes it come alive for them in a way that most people maybe don't grow up thinking about history. I think a lot of people think of history and they think it's a a boring list of names and dates, but there's so much more to it than that. Yeah, there is. I love history. Um, do you have a couple of funny or interesting stories from the annals of your society's history to share with us? You know, nothing in particular is really coming to mind to me, but every, every day is fun here. It's always just so different. Um, something different is happening every day. You know, yesterday we had third graders touring all of our museums. We have visitors coming in from the the community. We have people coming in with research requests, and then we have all of the behind-the-scenes work of taking care of for historic buildings. So it's every day's new and every day's fun. That's wonderful. What a lucky town to have somebody with your qualifications to protect and relate the history of the town. Seriously, the quality of the society and the community involvement shows. It really does show on the website. Can you tell the audience more about the facilities the society manages? Yeah, so uh, like I mentioned, we have four different historic facilities that we currently manage. Uh, the first being our Victorian House Museum. And that was the, the first property that the Historical Society acquired when it came into existence in the 1960s. There was a group of people who recognized that we needed a way to preserve our community's history, and the Victorian House provided the perfect place for them to do that. And so... It is currently set up like a Victorian house. It was, it's a house that was built in the 1860s, and so it's, it's currently furnished like it would have been from that era, although unfortunately we don't really have any of the original furnishings from that house because the family moved fairly soon after building it. We do have a couple of pieces that the family has since donated that were original, but the rest has all been donated by the community and is representative of that time period. Um, the Victorian house also has an addition that was added on in the 1990s, and that houses our gallery space where we have a different exhibit every year. It houses our offices, our programming room, and also our archives. And throughout history, that, that addition has been known as the Carriage House, Muse the Carriage House Edition, mm -hmm. but that name is really kind of misleading because people then expect to see carriages in it, and that's, that's not how it's used. Um, it's just kind of where 
the carriage house of the Victorian house would have been. So we're just trying to more focus on Victorian House Museum aspect of that name these days. The addition area then is also where we have our um, model train layout. Oh, so cool. that also came to us in the 1990s, and that's the Lenore train layout, and that's located in the basement here. That was built by a very uh, well-known model railroad builder named Bill Lenore, who grew up in Illinois and was inspired by the great uh, Chicago Great Western Railroad. And so that is a, a zero-gauge railroad, and it's a really neat layout. And um, we're hoping to then be able to move that to a different facility soon where you'll be able to see, like, almost all the way around it. So we're really excited about that. Oh, that's great. We also have the Ice House Museum, which we've talked about, is located right along the Cedar River. And that is an original ice house. It was used as an ice house from when it was built in 1922 wow. through the 1930s. And so that building is coming right up on its 100th anniversary next year, which we're really excited about. Um, it became a museum then in the, in the 80s. And that's something that the community really rallied behind. The building had been condemned. It had been used as a boathouse for many years. And the community really came together and recognized that this is a really beautiful, unique, round structure. It sure is. And came, came together to save that structure and, and turn it into a museum. Um, then we have this, this Little Red Schoolhouse, which was originally located in Bennington Township here in Black Hawk County and was then saved by community members again. There's a group uh, called the Clusters here in town, um, which are a national club of people who are interested in, his, in historic uh, items, and they helped save that building and move it to Cedar Falls. Cool. And it is also now one of our museums and is set up like, like, a, like a schoolhouse would have been. Now, tell us the really cool and, part, Carrie. Tell us the cool part of the schoolhouse building. It just doesn't sit there waiting for people to come and look at it, right? You actually use that building every year for school children. We do. That is one of our most popular programs. We have our summer as a schoolhouse program. So we'll have several week-long ses sessions where kids will come every morning. They get to discover what life was like in a little red schoolhouse. Oh, that's so cool. And in a one-room school, so... That is um, something that that program builds up very quickly every year. It's very popular. Very cool. Did you mention the petrol station? Uh, I did not yet. That, that would be our fourth facility. It's the Barron's Rap Service Station. And it, another thing that was saved by the community, it was um, in its original location, it was in danger of being torn down when they were widening the road. And so it was moved down right, it's just right between where our ice house and schoolhouse are located and is now used as a little visitor's information center. So visitors going along the bike trail there can stop in and get brochures all about everything in our community and also just see some, some neat uh, gas station-related things like a couple of, of vintage gas pumps sitting right outside. Thank you for that, Carrie. Let's not kid ourselves. It takes excellent leadership skills to manage and maintain all of these facilities and everything that's going on at the society. Is it all done with volunteers from the community? Yes, so we have a very small staff. There are four of us on staff here. It's myself, and we have a programming and outreach coordinator, Diane Schutbach, and then we have a collections manager and curator, Julie Huffman Klinkowitz, and we have a maintenance coordinator, Jim Weber. But obviously, with four of us and four buildings to take care of and run, as we need a lot of help. We have over 100 volunteers who help us run our museums every year. And oh, wow, they do things, great. everything from helping us with gardening to helping in the archives to helping out with field trips. And one of our biggest needs, which is as hosts in our museums on the weekends. So, you know, the four of us, we can't staff our museums every week and we can't be here seven days a week. Yeah. And so if we want our museums to be open and available to the public. We need volunteers to be able to step in and run those museums and make sure that they're open. Have you seen any change in the volunteer levels since COVID came? Uh, yes, unfortunately, we did have some of our volunteers who were not comfortable with working with the public during yeah. that time, which is very, very understandable. But it does make it very hard for us to be able to staff our buildings the same amount of time that we were pre-COVID. Yeah, it's hitting everybody. 
With your leadership, you're planning to bring a new facility online at 315 Clay Street. And I read somewhere the new facility is going to provide the society with additional storage space, among other things. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, so this building is something that we are very excited about because it will allow us to expand as an organization. You know, history is always happening. We always have artifact donations coming in, and we can't just decide that we're going to stop collecting at a certain point because we've run out of room. We need more space for those um, artifacts to be cared for. So this building is just two doors down from where our offices are at the Victorian House. So it was the perfect location for us to be able to expand. And we've already done a lot of work on the lower level of that building to turn it into that additional storage space. Cool. And then we have plans to add on to the building. So we plan to renovate the first floor of the existing building into a much larger classroom space, which will allow us to hold many more program participants than we currently can. And then the addition will house a two-story museum that focuses on agriculture industry, business, and transportation in Cedar Falls, and will be much more interactive and will allow us to tie in some STEM concepts with that. And then there will also be a lower floor on that addition as well that will give us even more storage space. Oh, that's and fantastic. So, wow. Yeah, it's, it's something we're very excited about, being able to keep growing as an organization. When will that facility be completely done and ready? As of everything, it's all dependent on funding. So. We're, we're working on the fundraising for that building, and as soon as we feel we have enough funds to be able to go ahead with construction, we're, we're ready to do that. We have all the plans in place. It's just we need to get that fundraising completed. Right. Listeners from Cedar Falls, you can view a drawing of the exciting new facility on the website, on the Cedar Falls Historical Society website. Please do donate so that this can come online. Uh, Carrie, I think you just said part of it will be dedicated to agriculture? Yes. So, yeah, it's, it's four main themes. Agriculture is one of those four main themes. You know, um, being located along the Cedar River, like we've talked about, we have very fertile ground here. And Egg was really one of the first things that drew people to this area. So it's really, a, and it's, it's still a very important part of our area here. Yeah. So yep. it's one of those fun, fundamental parts that uh, really tells the story of how our community developed. Can you tell the audience more about the society, when it started, the mission, the objectives of the society? Yeah, so the Cedar Falls Historical Society was first formed in 1962 and was officially incorporated in 1964. Okay. And our mission is to preserve, teach about, and celebrate the heritage of our community. And so we do that through many different ways, through the exhibits at our museum, through preserving the artifacts, and through a wide range of programs that we offer every year. You started in 2018 as the executive director, and I really feel like You've been sort of getting your arms around managing the cost and maintenance of society operations. Uh, there's a lot of things that have to be done every single year, and then there's ongoing maintenance that has to be done. Um, I like to think of that as chapter one of your tenure. I believe chapter two is where you're going to lead the society forward into growth and innovation. I have to assume you have some kind of a strategic plan I know part of that is 315 Clay Street and getting the new facility up and running. What about digitization of documents and photographs? Yes, obviously we live in a very digital world now, and we've learned a lot about that over the last year. That's something that we're slowly starting to kind of dip our toes into. We've started putting a, a few extra digital resources on our website as we've been able to, and cataloging our entire collection and making sure that we have digital evidence of everything so that we have things in more than one place. And it's, yeah, it's, it's something that we're always working towards slowly but surely. What else is in your strategy for the future? Do you mind sharing that? Like you said, uh, one of the biggest things is that facility at 315 Clay Street. That's really going to give us so many opportunities to grow. You know, that bigger programming space will allow us to offer uh, bigger and better programs. Um, that museum really will let us to tell the story of our city in a way that we really never have been able to before. None of our other facilities really tells the story of our whole community the way that one will. And it will allow us to keep, keep
keep collecting and preserving our history and keep growing and expanding. Now, I've read a lot of things about you and your, your leadership style and so on in preparation for today's show. It all tells a story of a continued desire of the society to be involved in the community. Um, your business and leadership capabilities are a recipe for success. Managing and especially maintaining the Victorian House and the other facilities. By the way, for those who have not visited the Victorian House, it's really magnificent. I don't know anything about the different styles of architecture. I know Gothic and all this stuff, but I couldn't tell you a Gothic house to save my soul. But to me, the house is the wow architecture style. I want to tell listeners that there are events going on all the time driven by the society. Carrie and the team seem to be continuously busy. Carrie, can you tell us about some of those events? Yes. Yeah, so we have a full program series every year that really lets us reach different audiences. We try to offer a wide variety of types of programs, everything from lectures to workshops to events like story times that are aimed at kids and families. And so really, however your learning style is, we have something for you. Uh, we have a different exhibit every year at the Victorian House in the edition, and so we always try to tie in a lot of our programs with that exhibit series. And we also have a Cabinets of Curiosity series which goes along with different mini exhibits that we put in the Victorian house. So the house as a whole, it's really hard. You can't really be changing a lot about the house constantly, but we also want to keep it fresh and keep want people wanting to come back. So yeah. we try to offer a different small exhibit there every season. Right now we have an exhibit of girly candles, that's G-U-R-L-E-Y candles, mm -hmm. which a lot of people I think would probably recognize from their childhood. And so... We'll have a program coming up soon that goes along with that, talking about the history of those candles and what the collection of those candles looks like. We also try to offer different events every year. So one of our big events that we've done twice and our third one will be coming up in February 2022 is our Ice Harvest Festival, which allows us to really bring the process of ice harvesting to life out at Big Woods Lake here, here in Cedar Falls. So we have some members of the local Amish community who come in and demonstrate ice cutting on the lake there, which is something that they still do for their food preservation. And we'll have all the other activities going on out there at, at the lake that day. It'll be just a really great day for families to come out and, and see history come to life. And, and we're always looking for ways to partner with others. We have the Teaching Iowa History Project, which is something that the Iowa Museum Association put together. Okay. And so we've contributed to that by putting together um, little stories that go along with some of our artifacts here, and that allows teachers to be able to tie in those primary, or primary resources and artifacts with their lesson plans. We have many schools who come and visit every year on field trips, and... And we also try to work with all grade levels for schools, so everything from pre-K up to through, through college. So we have the University of Northern Iowa here in Cedar Falls as well. So we're always working with interns and, and students through, through the university. Yeah, that helps everybody, huh? That's yeah. great. As you can tell, listeners, I'm a fan of Carrie's, and I'm a fan of what the society is doing for the community, uh, how they're growing and how they continue to move forward. That kind of growth and leadership doesn't just happen by accident. It's a testament to what can happen when you have all the right ingredients for success among Carrie and her team, uh, the board, and uh, all of these ingredients have to be working together. Uh, but especially important is community support, and I believe the society has that. Between you and I, Carrie, with COVID driving all of us crazy, but uh, also more toward virtual events and given the maturity with the state of technology, I really hope you can move the society forward in video creation and perhaps public television and radio in the area. Yes, uh, we have learned a lot over the last year and a half about making videos. Uh, we really, it's not something we really ever did before, but for the past two years now, all of our programs have been virtual. They've all been in video form That's fantastic. and while we hope to go back to doing in-person events next year uh, we do plan to keep recording all of our programs and putting them online so that we can reach people even if they can't come 
at the time of the program or if they don't live in Cedar Falls, they, they'll still be able to benefit from our programming. Yeah. And maybe that's make that them, we want to keep improving on, definitely. Maybe make them available to members only or a portion of them available, like workshops or something like that. I know uh, everybody... That's, oh, go ahead. Consider. So I just was going to say that is something to consider. I know everybody squeezed these days for funding, and that can be quite a challenge, especially with the COVID monster out there. Um, what kind of funding model supports the society? What are your funding goals? So, yes, it obviously takes a lot of money to run for museums and, and care for those historic buildings and care for our artifacts. And so we have a lot of different funding streams. We, always, we are a not-for-profit, not for so we are able to accept donations from the public. And they're tax-free. Yes. They are tax deductible as allowed by, by law, so that is an option for people. Yep. Uh, we also have endowment funds, which we are very fortunate to have that provide us with a lot of operating support each month. We have memberships, so people can join as a member of the Historical Society. And also we have things like admission. On, the Ice House Museum is the only one of our buildings to charge admission, but that is another way of, of raising money. Um, as well as gift shop sales and and grants. We're always looking for grants that can help support us, too. Do you get help from the community writing grants? Um, as the director, I do most of the grant writing okay. myself. What other types of fundraising activities? Do you have, like, annual events? We don't really do much as far as um, fundraising events, although occasionally some of our programs will have We'll have a registration fee attached to them that helps us fund those programs and right. helps us raise funds for the Historical Society. Uh, one thing that we do do that helps us raise funds as well is we offer bus tours to other areas of the country. We have a volunteer who is very good at putting together and planning bus tours. And so we'll have people, we'll handle all the registrations for those bus tours and that. Um, helps us make a little profit off those as well. Yeah, that, those are really unique um, and uh, exciting. Those are great for people. Yes, and he does an, a rich cognitive. He does an excellent job of planning those trips to so many different unique, interesting destinations throughout the country. What's your next one coming up? Uh, there's one coming up here at the end of November, which will be to Arbor Day Farm um, in Nebraska. And so that's the place where Arbor Day really started, and now they have a really nice lodge and grounds there, and they, they do all sorts of activities, and that'll be a, a really fun and interesting destination, yeah, and also very cool. holiday-themed. So, Do you uh, continue to do the tours over the winter, or do they kind of break, and then you start up again in spring? Um, the bus tours, it really all just depends on where Rich decides to go and, and what's going on in the destinations at, at various times. So most of them, we do try to have a holiday, one that's close to Christmas every year. And yes, most of them then do happen in the spring and summer outside yeah, of that. That makes sense. How's the COVID pandemic affecting your society? Um, it, yeah, it's, it's had a lot of an effect. Obviously, last year in 2020, we were forced to be closed to the public due to mandates from March 17th through May 27th. Okay. And so that was a really interesting time. But we were then pleased to be able to reopen on May 28th, even though things looked a little different. We obviously had to put in a lot more sanitation measures. We did cut back on our hours a little at the ice house and the schoolhouse due to fewer volunteers being available. For a while, the second floor of the Victorian home was closed because sanitizer can really be very hard on woodwork and the banisters. Yeah. And we've had to remove a lot of our hands-on things because we didn't want contamination happening there and it's hard to keep up with the sanitizing, with especially when we're relying on volunteers to do that. We want people to be able to be hands-on and not just be a place where you can only come and look and read because we know people have different learning styles. Yeah. So that was very difficult for us to have to make that decision. But now this year, we've really been um, slowly putting all those things back in place. Our, our kids' corner of the Victorian house is reopened. Oh, we are slowly starting to add on, add back the hands-on elements of the schoolhouse and, and the ice house. And we've reopened the second story of the Victorian house. We're still operating on the reduced hours at the ice house and schoolhouse. So I have hope that 
as more volunteers become comfortable with coming back, that we'll be able to add those hours back on next year, I hope. You know, during all this time, our staff has still been working. During the time that we were closed, part of our staff was working from home. We were kind of staggering when we were in the office, but someone has always been here in the office to answer the phone. We've always been available by email. We've always kept working to make those adjustments to our programs so they could be offered virtually. Yeah. It's, it's been interesting, and we're, we're trying to incorporate some of those lessons that we've learned about virtual meetings and virtual programs and, and keep those going even as things start to return to, quote-unquote, normal. Yeah, big cultural change. Hey, Carrie, um, it's time for our first break for a few minutes. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Listeners, we'll be right back with our guest, Carrie Eildertz of the Cedar Falls, Iowa Historical Society, after these words. Just a reminder about the holidays we celebrate annually in these United States. Armed Forces Day is to acknowledge those still in uniform. Veterans Day is for those who served and have hung up their uniform. Memorial Day is for those who never made it out of their uniform. Please teach your children to observe these days each year. Hello, this is Sean Thomas. If you have a society in your area, then please support them with both your volunteer time and your funding. The more support they have, the more they can benefit the community in terms of providing records for family research and education for the public and students in grades K through 12. With adequate funding, the society can stand up a museum or sponsor historical and fun events in order to tell the historical story of the area and its inhabitants. Maintaining a society makes a huge difference in a community. Please don't wait. Show your support for your local historical or genealogical society today. They preserve our heritage and culture for existing and future children of all ages. Thank you. I've heard so much about Magic Touch, Campana's new cream makeup. Is it so very different from other makeup? It's so different that you'll never believe how much prettier it will make you until you try it. Magic Touch is a cream complexion makeup that you apply with your fingertips. No powder puff, no water. You can use it anytime, anywhere. And it literally performs magic for your complexion. Gives you that new complexion loveliness that women are demanding today. The unmade-up look. Magic Touch provides a feminine, delicate, fragile makeup beauty. The Dresden doll-like complexion that women are seeking. What does it look like? Magic Touch is a wafer-thin cream in a beautiful white and gold compact. It offers you six new complexion flattering shades. All you do is stroke your fingertips across the surface of the cream, apply to your face, and blend. Magic Touch contains a new magic ingredient that causes it to blend better than any cream makeup yet invented. Do I use powder, too? No, if you want the new luminous effect, and I don't mean shiny. Yes, if you want to give your complexion a matte finish. Either way, Magic Touch gives you a new, flawless-looking complexion. Is Magic Touch very expensive? Surprisingly inexpensive. You get a large-size, classic, golden-white compact of Magic Touch for only one dollar. I'm going to try it tomorrow. And believe me, you'll never know how pretty you can be until you do. Hello, my plebes. This is Cleopatra, Queen of the Nile. While I'm waiting for Mark Anthony, I'm listening to Preservation Oaks on MicroStream Radio. And now for a bit of selfless promotion. Please consider supporting MicroStream Radio. We can't do it without you. We rely solely on the generous financial support of individuals from all across the world to power programs which enrich lives, inspire minds, and celebrate diverse perspectives.
A contribution of any amount makes you a member. Show your support today at www.patreon.com backslash microstream radio. Your support allows us to bring you more unique and interesting content. We thank you so much. At Preservation Oaks, we love history. Not dry boring dates and facts, but rather the stories of the past about the people who were there. We believe history is our cultural fabric. We are very grateful for our historical and genealogical society guests, who share interesting history and information about their society, their current needs, and about what makes them unique. We believe citizens need to understand their history, how their societies function, how best to support them, the history they preserve, and the services provided to members and the public. We must preserve our history for future generations. We must share and educate the current crop of youngsters, and share with pride the history and progress of our cities, counties, and states. We must help people find their roots and culture from the past. If you're a historical or genealogical society listening to Preservation Oaks, and you'd like to be a guest on the program, please email preservationoaks at gmail.com. Again, that's preservationoaks at gmail.com. Listeners, thank you for listening. You can comment anytime about the show or send suggestions by emailing preservationoaks at gmail.com. Thank you. And now, back to Preservation Oaks. Welcome back to Preservation Oaks. I'm your host, Sean Thomas Radcliffe, and we are here today with Carrie Eldertz from the Cedar Falls, Iowa Historical Society. In this next segment, we're going to chat about the society's role in the community, what kinds of outreach is done, and any records or collections, either on site or online, the society maintains for the public and their members. Carrie, welcome back. Thank you. Carrie, are there any other types of communication, outreach, or education that we haven't already covered that the society undertakes within the community? We try to do a, a variety of ways of doing outreach from, with our programs, with um, field trips and partnerships with local schools. We're always looking for partnerships that we can do with, with other uh, organizations in the community this summer. We uh, partnered with the Cedar Falls Public Library for one of their story times located at our schoolhouse. And so that was really a, a fun way to do a partnership there. We're always trying to communicate these things with, with the public through our newsletter, okay. which Good. comes out twice a year. Uh, we also do a lot of social media and really over the last uh, year and a half or so, really tried to up our presence on social media so that we were always having a way to keep in contact with the community and keep sharing about our history and sharing little fun tidbits and educational things there as a way to keep connected with people even when they weren't able to come to our facilities. Does the society conduct surveys of the members to get their input, something like SurveyMonkey? As far as I'm aware, that's not really something that we've done in the past, but it is actually something that we started talking about, probably maybe doing something like that next year um, as we get farther into this uh, project with our new facility at 315 Clay Street. We're starting to think about, you know, what comes next after that and what, what does the community want, want from us. So that is something that we're starting to talk about doing. Oh, fantastic. Do you operate a genealogical service where you do genealogy research for people? Do you have a genealogical library? Yeah, we do. We have archives here. So we have a lot of, of resources and documents and photographs and things that have been donated to us. Okay. And we have our collections manager and curator, Julie. She takes research requests. And a lot of those research requests that come in are people who are studying their genealogy and want to learn more about their family members who lived in Cedar Falls. What kinds of records or historical artifacts has the society received, uh, let's say this year, as donations from the public? Uh, it's interesting. We always have such a wide variety of things that people want to donate to us. Our focus is very much on Cedar Falls, 
So everything that we take in has to have a Cedar Falls connection, yeah. or it has to be directly tied to one of the topics of one of our buildings. So the Victorian area for the Victorian house, or ice cutting and ice harvesting on the river for the ice house, or something that would have been used in a schoolhouse. We just yesterday had a, a couple of interesting things come in. We had someone bring in a, a lot of old toys from her childhood, which are really fun to see. Also, we get lots of clothing donations from various eras, and so those are always really fun. Wedding dresses are great because there's always a story that goes along with a wedding dress. Yeah. And oftentimes photos of the people who actually wore it, which just, again, really brings, brings in the stories that go along with those artifacts. We talked briefly about volunteers and the fact that you rely on over 100 volunteers. Do those volunteers do the genealogical research? And also, what kind of volunteer opportunities does the society have for members and the public? Um, most of the actual research is done by our collections manager, Julie. Um, but she does have people who help her in the archives doing cataloging and inventorying. Since our, our collection is so vast, it takes a lot to manage that and, yeah. and document it. Um, our collection is over 40,000 objects and growing. Wow. And so we have volunteers who help in a variety of ways. We have people who help us with gardening. We have people who help us on field trips because we have classes that want to visit all of our buildings. And so we need people helping and leading, leading those kids through each of the facilities. We have people who like to just help out once in a while with a special program. So we have a, a great group of people who really want to help with that ice harvest festival I was talking about. So they'll, right. they'll come out in February on that day and help us run that. Each of our buildings has a, a council. So we have an ice house council, a Victorian house council, and a, student, and a schoolhouse council. And the members of those councils then will, will help us with the finding volunteers to staff those buildings and will help with the program planning to go along with each of those buildings. So plenty of opportunities if anybody wants to call and uh, volunteer or come through the website and submit a volunteer request, you've got something for everybody to do. Yes, definitely. Hey, how does the society um, interface with state and county, and maybe regional societies? How do you do that? How does it help your members? Do you get loans of exhibits from other places? Um, one of the biggest ways that we connect with other historical societies and museums is through the Iowa Museum Association. That is a statewide association that really helps with providing resources for museums and provides a lot of networking opportunities. Uh, just a few weeks ago, our staff all attended the virtual Iowa Museum Association annual conference, which provides lots of learning opportunities for us to learn best practices and trends within the museum industry. And so that way you can always be keeping up to date and finding new and fresh ideas that we can then bring back and offer to our, our community. We're often in contact with other museums and helping each other out as far as, you know, if we need advice how to formulate a certain policy or if they had a program that went well and how, how, how did they do that program. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Very cool. Um, sometimes, you know, we'll find items in our collection that, really don't belong in our collection. So we have that network we can reach out and find another home for those items where they more belong and where they'll be more useful to their communities. And so it's, it's great to be able to network with other museums in that way. Absolutely. Do you have a historian working at the Society? I don't know that any of us would really consider ourselves a historian if we would label ourselves that way. But we all have, obviously, a lot of knowledge of the history of our community and a lot of experience in those areas. Right. I wanted to lead into what kinds of interesting books has your society published? A few years ago, um, the Historical Society published a book. There's a series out there called Images of America. Okay. And so there's places all over the country that have these books that um, tell the history of the community through photographs. And so we did an Images of Modern America, so it's more recent history that have been told through photographs in our collection in that book, and which I believe is the only one that we have published as a historical society. But we do have a lot of people in the community who are um, interested in history in various areas and have written various books, and we try to carry a lot of those in our gift shop. Oh, that's great. I want to remind the listeners that the... Um 
website for the society is www.cfhistory.org and that you can further reach the society at 319-266-5149. And that brings me to the website. What kinds of things are available for people to do when they visit your website? Yes, so our website provides opportunities where you can learn more about each of our four facilities, learn about the history of those buildings, and also learn about where they're located, when they're open, things like that. You can also find our whole list of programs that we have coming up. And um, over the last couple of years, then that we've been recording those programs virtually. You can go and watch all of those programs on video on our website, as well as finding them on our YouTube channel or Facebook page. Um, we've tried to really add a lot more uh, activities that you can do at home to connect with history. We've got coloring pages. We have a walking tour on there. For our Summer at the Schoolhouse program, we've added some of the activities that kids do there to our website as well, especially since last year we weren't able to hold the program in person, so we put a lot of those activities online instead. We've also tried to start adding more digital research resources for people. We've added a few of our city directories on there that people can access on the website, as well as programs from Sturgis Fall celebrations over the years. And okay. so that's our, our community's big um, annual festival every summer is the Sturgis Fall celebration because Cedar Falls was originally called Sturgis Falls. Ah, I was going to so ask. that's remembered through the name of that festival. Cool. So we have some of those programs available on our website. And we also have, of course, all of the ways where you, you can connect with us, all of our contact information, ways to become a member, ways to become a volunteer, ways to donate and support us that way. Okay, good. So beyond using the technology to facilitate virtual events and working from home, which, you, you know, there's been this cultural shift over the last year due to COVID, how is your society incorporating how modern society is changing? You know, we have uh, lots of different groups and sometimes in history we focus on like women's suffrage and things that have happened in the past. There's things going on right now where there's immigration, where lots of new people are coming into the area that uh, don't have a history there. And so the, there's changes in the local economy and changes in, in history going on now. How do you recognize that and adapt to it? Yes, that's something that we've been very conscious of and try to take into consideration when we're making decisions. Um, it's hard because, like you said, a lot of that history isn't necessarily um, documented very well yet anyway. We, we really uh, are limited to what we've been given from people as far as our, our resources for those types of things. And so you know, I would encourage people who want to see their own history represented here to think about things from their lives now because history is always happening. History is not just what happened 100 years ago. Right. We're interested in adding those types of resources to our collections that we are able to tell all of those stories. But yeah, and just finding little ways in which we can constantly make improvements in doing that. You know, last year we had the upstairs of the Victorian house closed and so we put together a booklet that showed the upstairs and each of the rooms up there and in there we had one of the bedrooms labeled as the master bedroom. And we heard a comment from one of our visitors, you know, that that's not really a term that's used anymore. And so we, we looked into it and realized that, yes, even like realty is moving away from using the term master bedroom. And so huh. we replaced that page and we started calling that bedroom either the parents' bedroom or the main bedroom. And just it's little things like that where we're just always trying to, to listen to our community and, and um, do the best that we can in making changes. Speaking of listening to your community and adapting to current historical things going on, you've, you've got something on your website that is just a great idea uh, about COVID-19, uh, where you're collecting information from the, the uh, members and from the community about how COVID-19 mm -hmm. is affecting them. Can you chat about that for a moment? Yeah, like I said, we want we want people to always remember that history is not just what happened 100 years ago, and especially over these last couple of years, we've really seen that history is happening every day. It's changing so fast every day, and we want 
to be able to remember that as it's happening. And so we want to know how people coped with the pandemic, if they've been keeping journals, if they've been keeping records of the things that they did while they were quarantined, um, keeping items like like the masks. We've added several masks to our collection now and, and stickers from when we got vaccinated. Huh. And so it, it's those kinds of things that we don't want it to slip through the cracks so that someday we don't remember what this time was like. We want to be able to document it and record it. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea, idea and it's uh, actually unique um, so far in my dealings with other historical societies. It's a great idea, and hopefully it'll you know, end up into a historical book or a historical exhibit or something like that to tell that story. Can you tell the audience about any current initiatives or needs of the society? Uh, what do you want people in your area to know about and support right now? Is the new building at 315 Clay Street the highest priority? Yes, I would say that is our definitely our highest priority is um, raising funds so that we can complete that project and, and get it open and, and used by the public. But of course, there's also all of the regular maintenance and things that go along with operating the rest of our facilities as well all of the different repairs that need to be done to buildings and just the general operating costs of having a staff and being able to offer programs. And so, yeah, 315 Clay Street is definitely our highest priority for fundraising. But we don't want to forget all of all of the normal operating costs as well. It, yeah. it, take, it takes money to preserve our history, you know, to have artifacts stored in um, archival quality containers and boxes and conditions. And it's, it's not cheap, and I think um, that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily realize. They think they can just drop things off here, and then we we stick them on exhibit, and that's it. And no, I mean, we have so much more, so many more artifacts than we can ever exhibit at one time, and we need to be able to still care for and preserve those items even when they're not on display. Maybe it would be a good idea to have an exhibit on what archiving entails and the costs the proper way to archive and preserve something for the future. Yeah, that, that would really be an, an interesting thing. And I think a lot of people would be very interested and surprised about what it really takes. Yeah, exactly. Um, in your view as the executive director, Carrie, why is this society important to the community? We are the only ones who are preserving our community's history. and taking care of those items that tell the stories of how our community has developed and how we've gotten to where we are today. I think having that history of our community preserved and displayed here is something that can really give people a source of pride and a sense of place and belonging within the community, whether they've lived here their whole life or whether they just moved here yesterday. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it's very important. Um, if I'm contemplating joining the society, what's the benefits of membership? The biggest benefit is just knowing that you are supporting that work of preserving our history and, and building that, that fabric of our community. There are other little perks that come with it. You get signed up for our, our newsletter that comes out twice a year, so you're one of the first to know what's going on here and what we're doing. You get two free tickets to the Ice House Museum per year. And you get discounts for the summer at the schoolhouse program and also on those bus tours that Rich um, plans to go across the country. So oh, that's great. There's some perks that go along with that. But I think just knowing that you're belonging to and supporting the work that we're doing is, is one of the biggest benefits. Are most of your members, you know, living in the area or do you have a percentage of members uh, outside of the community? I would say that a vast majority of our members do live in Cedar Falls in the nearby area, but we do have members who are all over the country. A lot of them are people who have lived in Cedar Falls and have moved away and still want to support us, or they have discovered that they had ancestors who lived in Cedar Falls at one point, and maybe they've been able to do some research through us that helped them learn about their families, and they've decided to support us in that way, or they, they're researching other things that we can help them with and, and want to support us then. Uh, so yeah, we have members all over. Um, we even have one member who lives in Denmark. So oh, we do have an international member. Um, wow. uh, Cedar Falls has a very rich Danish heritage. We were one of the largest Danish communities 
in in Cedar Falls at one point. Oh, I didn't and know so that. This, yeah, this member, he had family members who had connections to Cedar Falls, and even though he's still in Denmark, he's, he's one of our members. That's really fun. You mentioned the genealogical research for members and the public outside of Cedar Falls, or actually inside and outside Cedar Falls, to get to research their family and get help for that. Is that free if you're a member, or how does that work? We do offer um, the first half hour of research is free. So anyone, whether you're a member or not, you can have half an hour of research for free. And a lot of research questions can be answered within that time. If it's something that's more expensive and it's going to take a lot more time than half an hour, we do have a fee schedule for that then. Okay. What's the best way for people to connect with the society? Is it through the website or would you prefer a call or... Yeah, so if you go on our website, you can find all of our contact information. So each of us on the staff here has an email address, so depending on if you're wanting to look into doing programming or tours, you would reach out to our programming and outreach coordinator, research requests, um, our best emails to our collections manager and curator. Other questions can come to me through email. But we also have our phone number listed on the website there. That's another way that you can get a hold of us. And you're always welcome to make an appointment to come in and talk to any of us in person. Having the opportunity of this program, Carrie, is there any other information or any message you'd like to share with the community, your members or potential members, anything you would like them to know about? Good to get it out there that we are here and we have all of these different offerings. I think a lot of people, you know, they drive past our facilities and have never been in them and they're welcome to come in. And they're great places to look around and to learn. Uh, we have all of these different types of programs that appeal to people of all ages and all learning styles. And we are a not-for-profit business, and so we, we rely on the support of our community. I think a lot of people have, see the word Cedar Falls in our name and think that we are a, a city entity, which we're not. We, we are private, not-for-profit. Right. And we're, we're, we need the support to be able to keep offering those educational resources and to be able to keep preserving our stories and our buildings. Thank you very much, Carrie Elders, um, for spending time with us today. We really appreciate your time. We've run out of time, have to end the guest portion of the show, but I think I can speak confidently and on the behalf of the listeners by saying that I've learned so much and had a great time. I'm really glad to meet you, Carrie. It's an exciting time at Cedar Falls with the new building and the, all of the changes that you're introducing. Um, your society is doing a lot to help keep history alive for the community and your members. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And with that, listeners, uh, we'll end our time with our guest, Carrie Eildertz, the Executive Director of the Cedar Falls Historical Society. Uh, please stay tuned for my comments and wrap up, which is coming up next. Hello listeners, I hope you are doing well and staying safe. Do you know? Individual members provide the foundation of support on which all of MicroStream Radio's success is built. Your generosity helps keep us on the air with great programs. We rely on listeners like you. If you listen to the great programs here on MicroStream Radio, now is the time to show your support. It's a smart investment. As our membership grows and revenues increase, more great programs come back to you. Please take just a few moments to become a member today by going to www.patreon.com backslash microstream radio. A contribution of any amount makes you a member. We thank you so much for being here and for your support today. You're listening to Preservation Oaks on MicroStream Radio. If you enjoy the show, then please tell all your friends, family, neighbors, pals, business associates, colleagues, and maybe a couple of enemies about the show. Stay tuned for more episodes at www.preservationoaks.podbean.com. We thank you so much for spreading the love.
This is Christy Deitmeyer from the Dyersville Area Historical Society, and I love listening to Sean Thomas Radcliffe on MicroStream Radio. This is Sean Thomas's favorite computer, and I listen to Sean Thomas Radcliffe and Preservation Oaks. Do you want to be an official member of Preservation Oaks? Of course you do. Just go to patreon.com backslash microstreamradio and become a Patreon. If you're a historical or genealogical society listening to Preservation Oaks, and you'd like to be a guest on the program, please email preservationoaks at gmail.com. Again, that's preservationoaks at gmail.com. Listeners, thank you for listening. You can comment anytime about the show or send suggestions by emailing preservationoaks at gmail.com. Thank you. And now, back to Preservation Oaks. And welcome back. What a great show. I'm your host, Sean Thomas Radcliffe. What a value add to the community is the Cedar Falls Historical Society. Always innovating to help the public. So let's recap. Carrie and I chatted about when Cedar Falls was known as the Garden City. How a portion of the downtown has been added to the National Registry of Historic Places. The possibility each year that the Ice House Museum will be impacted by river flooding. Listeners, please make your tax-deductible donation to the Cedar Falls Historical Society so they have a fund ready to deal with flood prevention and or flood cleanup if this should occur like it did in 2008 and 2016. How Cedar Falls has a rich Danish heritage. Those who want to learn more can connect with the Society via their website. How people can designate the Cedar Falls Historical Society as their organization of choice on Amazon Smile. From that point on, each time you use Amazon Smile, Amazon donates a portion of everything you purchase to the Society. It's automatic, and it's a great way to maintain consistent donations. How as a child, Carrie was always interested in history, but what really sealed the deal for a history future for Carrie was a history teacher who made history come alive. That's what I'm talking about. Now Carrie says, every day is different and fun. How the society began in 1962. How the Ice House Museum will celebrate its 100th anniversary in 2022. Way to go. The programs the society offers every year are all available on the website. Some of those are the Little Red Schoolhouse as Summer at the Schoolhouse each summer. A wide range and full schedule of programs throughout the year, including but not limited to lectures, story time for children, mini exhibits, and rotation of exhibits. There is a current program around Gurley Candles, that's G-U-R-L-E-Y, Candles, which also includes an exhibit. The annual Ice Harvest Festival, which is so cool. The local Amish people still cut ice from the rivers and lakes each year to preserve their food, and so they come to Cedar Falls and demonstrate how to cut ice for the public. This occurs, I think Carrie said, in February, and I sincerely wish I was there to see that one of these winters in the future. This year is the third annual festival. Please attend and support the Society. How the Society is lucky enough to have 100 volunteers from the community providing help to the four full-time staff members to manage the four facilities running the programs and genealogy research. The approach used is unique in my travels thus far and is worth mentioning. Carrie indicated that each facility, the Ice House Museum, the Victorian Home, the Little Red Schoolhouse, and the Petrol Station slash Visitor Center has what Kerry referred to as a council consisting of volunteers. The council schedules the volunteers, helps the public, and makes sure there are plenty of helpers at all times for the school children, field trips, and so on. I really like that idea. The society also plans and sponsors bus tours to various unique and exciting destinations. 
The next one is scheduled for the end of November to Arbor Day Farms in Nebraska. Please contact the Society if you're interested in joining a tour. Sounds really great. The 315 Clay Street facility is priority number one at this time. Its themes will be around Cedar Falls agriculture, industry, business, and transportation. Donations are needed to make this a reality. All engineering drawings are complete and available on the website. The new building will change things for the society. It will allow them to exhibit the full history timeline of the community and will give them additional archiving space. Here's an excellent quote from Kerry. History is always happening. We always have artifact donations coming in and we can't just decide that we're going to stop collecting at a certain point because we've run out of room. We need more space for the artifacts to be cared for properly. Okay, to get this building finished, what's needed now are public donations, so please do donate. Kerry also mentioned how people don't really understand the true cost of archival of an object. You need acid-free papers, acid-free boxes, document preservation, and so on. All of this costs money in order to preserve history properly. I suggested that perhaps the society could create an exhibit for the public so that they could see the methods and costs around archival. Bottom line, however, is that the society needs donations to ensure objects donated are properly stored into the future. Carrie also discussed how the society is embracing virtualization, digitization, web access, and social media in everyday operations. The Society is currently cataloging their entire 40,000 and growing object inventory prior to beginning to digitize what can be digitized. In addition, the Society is filming each program as much as possible and placing those videos on Facebook, YouTube, and on the Society's website. I suggested that perhaps some of those videos could be for members only in the future. Kerry also discussed how the Society is now contemplating what the next step is after the 315 building comes online. They're discussing how to determine what the community would like to see done in the future. So more on that from Kerry and the Society. The Society also published a book of Images of America. Their topic was Images of Modern America. That book can be picked up in the Society's gift shop along with several other noteworthy books by local authors. The Society also attends the annual Sturgis Falls Festival. Cedar Falls was once known as Sturgis Falls, and this festival is to remember that fact. Carrie and I had a discussion regarding how new history, recent changes in the local economy, or immigrants being integrated to the community are handled. Carrie said, we encourage people who want to see their own history represented to contact the Society in order to donate artifacts, money, and time, and then help the Society learn about and tell their story as a part of the fabric of the community. I think that's the best way to go. On the Society webpage, Carrie and team are doing something unique. They are asking the community to share their experiences about how they coped with COVID-19. And I think it's an excellent idea. To contribute to this very valuable method of capturing history as it occurs, go to the Society's website and follow the instructions there or contact the Society directly using the information on their website. Now there were a thousand questions I could have asked Carrie, but I didn't in order to stay on track with the time we had. So if questions occurred to you while you were listening to this program, please reach out to the Society via their website, and I'll also give the URL and the phone number coming up. The Cedar Falls Historical Society is preserving the history of Cedar Falls, Iowa for future generations and sharing the story of the culture and the history of the place. Next time I check in with Carrie, I hope to see the 315 Clay Street project well underway, COVID behind us, and the next step in Carrie's strategy for the Society in bloom. If you're a listener in Cedar Falls, or if you're a listener researching family history in the Cedar Falls, Iowa area, and you're not already a member, please consider joining and supporting the Society. 
Right now, donations and visitors are needed. The Cedar Falls Historical Society website URL is cfhistory.org. You can reach the Society by phone at 319-266-5149. I hope this information helps everyone understand how innovative and valuable the Cedar Falls Historical Society is to the community. Please help all you can by volunteering and donating to support them. The Cedar Falls Historical Society truly qualifies as one of our nation's preservation oaks. Okay, that's a wrap for this episode. Music used today is from Simba Bird and Scott Holmes. MicroStream Radio is a registered trademark. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2021 by MicroStream Radio. It cannot be commercially rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere for commercial purposes without the written permission of MicroStream Radio. Thanks to everyone for listening. This is Sean Thomas Radcliffe. See y'all next time for another episode of Preservation Oaks.